If you've got a Bible, you know what to do with it. Hold it up high. Go ahead and be turning to 1 Peter chapter 3, please. 1 Peter chapter number 3. We're going to be uh, kind of digging into a little bit more from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, if you remember this morning, uh, as we were getting ready to leave, I asked you to read one verse. I don't know if you remember what that one verse was here in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, but you've uh, uh, got only about, oh, I don't know, uh, about tw 22 verses to choose from. But we're going to look at verse 18. First uh, Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. I don't want you to uh, raise your hand if I ask you if you actually read that verse. You may already have it memorized. Uh, but I am, as we get started, going to take about five steps forward because I feel like I'm on the other side of the Great Gulf in Luke 16. But anyway, 
We're glad everybody's here. Glad uh, to uh, know that we've got people watching on uh, Facebook Live as we stream. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, great group, good crowd. We're glad everyone is here. And uh, if you are visiting, I don't see anyone who qualifies as a visitor. But if you are, uh, we're, we're extremely glad that you are uh, with us tonight. Abraham Lincoln went to a slave market. And while he was there, he took notice of a young, um, a young African-American woman who was being auctioned off to the highest bidder. And as the story goes, Abraham Lincoln started to bid on her. And he won. He was the highest bidder. And he could see the anger in the young woman's eyes and could only imagine what she was possibly thinking. Maybe she was thinking, oh, another white man will buy me. He'll use me and then just discard me. Well, Abraham Lincoln walked off with his property. And he turned to the woman and he told her, he said, you are free. You are free. The woman said, yeah, but what does that mean? Abraham Lincoln said, it means you're free. She said, well, does that mean that I can say whatever I want to say? Abraham Lincoln said, yes, you can say whatever you want to say. She went on and asked, does it mean that I can, that I can be whatever I want to be? To which Abraham Lincoln responded, yes, you can be whatever you want to to be she then asked does it mean that that I can go wherever I want to go well of course Abraham Lincoln once again said yes yes it means that you are free and you can go wherever you want to go and it was then with tears in her eyes that this this woman whom Abraham Lincoln had just purchased she said I think I will go with you I've always liked that story. True or false, I don't really know. I'm sure it is. But think about that. Here's a woman who has experienced slavery, being bought and sold maybe multiple times. And now another white man, Abraham Lincoln. You know Abraham Lincoln, don't you? You've heard his name before. I'm sure you have. Abraham Lincoln's the highest bidder. And, and he bought this young slave woman. And what did he basically do? He paid her price, whatever that was, whatever amount it was. He paid it, and he let her go free. And in return, when she somewhat understood what that meant, this young slave girl said, I think I will go with you. Kind of reminds me of the passage we looked at a little bit last week in Exodus chapter 21. The song that's based on that is Pierce My Ear. When a slave, uh, av after uh, six years of service, on that seventh year, if they wanted to, uh, they could remain a slave forever for their master. And, and, and to have that done, that master would take that slave uh, to the door or the doorpost of his house and would pierce that slave's ear through with an awl. And it was a sign or a symbol that that slave was going to now serve that master for a lifetime essentially what this young slave girl told Abraham Lincoln I'm gonna go with you tonight we're gonna talk about two words two words that I hope mean a lot to you and it's good to be reminded of these two words and the two words for tonight in our lesson are redeemed and reconciled redeemed and reconciled uh, redemption uh, in, in regards to sin means to be set free uh, by the payment of a ransom price. Much like the, the price that maybe Abraham Lincoln paid for that young slave girl. In regards to reconciliation and our relationship with God, reconciliation means that in Christ uh, the wrath that belonged to us has been satisfied. That, that, that two that have been separated have now been brought back together in a right relationship. So tonight, let's consider redemption. Let's consider uh, the, the wonderful blessings of uh, reconciliation, being reconciled and brought back uh, into a right standing uh, with God. There's a host of scriptures. I'm going to share some of them with you tonight. 
I want to begin with uh, uh, Psalm 107, verse 2. And we're going to get to where I've asked you to get to in your Bible in 1 Peter 3 in just a minute. Because that's going to be uh, really uh, the place that we really dig into and uh, break it down. But I just want to introduce redemption and reconciliation to you because they're all through uh, the Word of God. Old Testament, New Testament, all the way through. Psalm 107, verse 1 and 2. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those who have been redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Paul says, In which you once walked according to the course of this world. He says, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom you also once uh, conducted yourselves in the lust of our flesh. He says, Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, he says, children of wrath just as the others in verse number 13 Paul goes on but now he says but now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ that would be the definition of reconciliation you once were far off now you've been brought back near you've been brought back uh, to God through Christ verse 17 here in Ephesians 2 Paul goes on and he says, And he, that is Jesus Christ, came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him, Paul says in verse 18, Through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So tonight we're going to talk about, we're going to look at from Scripture, uh, from uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, uh, the ideas of redemption and, and reconciliation. I don't know if you have a favorite verse or maybe what I would call a tent peg verse that, that really uh, holds all the others maybe together. Uh, but 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 is a phenomenal verse. And of course you can say that about every verse uh, of Scripture for various reasons. But tonight I want you to uh, really uh, join me as we look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse uh, number 18. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And that's from the New King James Version. Now I want you to uh, take that verse in. I want you to really allow those words of inspiration to, to really take root in your mind. Listen to what Peter says, inspired of God. For Christ also suffered for sin. Once, suffered once for sins. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. There are five things that I want us to, uh, to take from that one verse. We're going to begin tonight to look at the sufficiency, the satisfaction, the substitution, the sacrifice, and the salvation that this one verse in 1 Peter 3.18 shows us. So let's talk about sufficiency from this one verse. Notice Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. Literally means once and for all. His sacrifice at the cross for sin was once and for all. In fact, you go back and you read Hebrews chapter 9 and you begin to learn that the sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered, not only once and for all, it was one that was never to have to be repeated again. It was the superior, perfect sacrifice. Sufficiently covers every sin and all sins once and for all. In fact, in John chapter 1, verse 29, John tells us, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I'm not much into the Greek or in uh, the structure of sentences, but I understand uh, that John says that this is for all sin, sin in the aggregate, the whole sum total, each and every sin, 100%. The song says he paid a debt he did not owe. 
I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. The idea here of this word sufficiency, that, that Jesus Christ suffered once for sins, means that he paid the entire sin debt of the world in full. Paid it in full. All sin. The entire balance of the human race sin debt, Jesus paid sufficiently. And it was paid for, for all people. Sufficient for each and every human being. John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 2 says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. But John says, but not only for ours, but also for the whole world. He didn't just die for my sins or your sins. Or if you're a white, black, purple, green, polka dotted, it didn't matter. If you are a human being, you have sin. And Jesus died for your sins and for mine, for each and every person. So his sacrifice once and for all was for all sin, for all people, but also, guess what else? For all time. For all time. It was a sacrifice to end all other sacrifices. No other sacrifices would be needed. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, the Bible says, But he, that is Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So, the offering, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is sufficient in every way. For all people, for all sin, for all times. Once for all. In fact, it is so permanent and, and does not need to be uh, repeated. It says there in Hebrews that, that Jesus sat down. Sat down. That sacrifice was complete. It was done. It was never to be required again. It was sufficient once and for all. Isn't that good to know? Isn't it wonderful to know that, that your sin debt, my sin debt, has been paid in full? The sufficiency of his sacrifice once and for all. But notice also something closely connected to uh, the sufficiency. And that is the satisfaction the satisfaction that the, uh, the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross brought to God in his holy justice, his wrath was satisfied. Was satisfied. Notice he says here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once uh, for uh, sins, the just for the unjust. Why did Jesus die? He suffered because of our sins. So we need to know uh, that, that sin comes with an awful cost. It comes with an awful cost. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 59 in verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You go all the way back into Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 is a powerful verse. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. The blood. But not the blood of animals or goats or bulls or anything else, but we're talking about the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus paid that price for each and for every one. Peter tells us of this precious blood. 1 Peter chapter 1 as he writes about redemption. In verse 18 he says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, and he lists like silver and gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but he says, With the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The precious blood of Christ. Peter goes on in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and he gives us these words, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you're healed. 
Jesus Christ satisfied the wrath of God in his own death for our sins. Here's a familiar verse, Romans 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserved. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is what? You remember? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament is Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 at verse number 11. The Bible says, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Be satisfied. God's justice and his holiness were satisfied there at the cross where Jesus died. So we have sufficiency and we have satisfaction. God's wrath because of our sins was satisfied by the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ there on the cross. Now we get to the really hard part. This is where it gets really personal. This is where we ought to maybe take off our shoes and hold out our toes. Because I want us to know uh, that, that Jesus died in your place. He died in my place. We're going to talk about substitution. Substitution. There in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Peter writes the words, The just for the unjust. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. The just for the unjust. For Christ suffered for sins once the just for the unjust quite literally it is the just one in the place of the unjust the one who deserved what Jesus took Jesus took it for them he died in our place the just for the unjust back to Isaiah 53 verse number 4 Isaiah writes surely he has borne our griefs I want you to see this in your own Bible. If you're in Isaiah 53, notice these words, these personal pronoun words. Surely he, Jesus, our suffering servant, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He goes on and he says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Notice the substitution. Notice the fact that Jesus takes our place. He goes on and says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord has laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus died in your place he died in my place Jesus did not deserve anything that he took but he took it for you he took it for me Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 6 for when we were still without strength in due time Christ died for who you remember what the verse says the ungodly he died for the ungodly the just for the unjust Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. The Bible says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Jesus died the death that we deserved. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know the, the price for sin, Romans 6, 23, is death. Jesus was perfect. He was sinless, but yet he went to the cross. And so there, there is a, a judicial tone uh, in, in this statement, the just for the unjust. That is, the, the innocent for the guilty. You see, all the world is unjust, each and every one of us. Romans 3 and verse 9 uh, tells us that, that Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. But there's only one who is just. It's not me, it's not you, it's not any of us. It's the one and only Jesus Christ himself. He alone is just. Think about Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Verse 22, he, he preached, Men of Israel, hear these words. 
Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by wonders and miracles and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. In another sermon in Acts chapter 3, verse 14, Peter says, But you have denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. The just for the unjust. That don't put a lump in your throat, I'm not sure what would. Knowing that Jesus went to the cross willingly. For who? For me. For you. For every one of us. Substitution. He took your place. But let's move on and talk about the sacrifice. Back there in 1 Peter chapter 3, chapter 3 verse 18, Peter says that he was put to death, being put to death. Jesus died. That was the number one reason for him coming, being born of uh, the virgin, putting on flesh and blood, to be like you and I so he could actually die. God, without putting on flesh and blood, could not die. He's eternal. So he had to come in human form, in flesh and blood, so he could die. And he could die there at the cross but he didn't just merely die there was purpose there's meaning in in his sacrificial death in Acts chapter 2 verse 23 again it says him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God church it was in the eternal plan and purpose of Almighty God for Jesus Christ uh, to die on that cross even before the foundations of of the world Acts chapter 2 verse 36 tells us, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, he says, both Lord and Christ. There was purpose in the sacrifice. Acts chapter 4 beginning in verse 10, we pick up more on this purpose. Let it be known to all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he says, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And I like verse 12. Acts 4 and verse 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, purpose. Predetermined and thought out purpose in the sacrifice of Jesus it wasn't just another common criminal crucified on the hill of Calvary there was purpose there in the death of Jesus Christ in his sacrifice you see every other sacrificial victim the world has ever known remains dead but guess what that sacrifice on that day the perfect Lamb of God. He rose the third day. He rose the third day. And His resurrection, His being made alive again, is proof positive that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was accepted by God the Father. And He was raised, according to Paul in Romans 1 and verse 4, He was raised with power. He was declared to be uh, the Son of God. I like Romans 8 and verse 4. Romans 8 and verse 34. Who is he who condemns? Good question. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Again, purpose. There was, there was purpose in that sacrifice as Jesus died uh, in our place. But I think probably one of the more familiar, maybe even the more thought-provoking verses that deals with the, with the sacrifice of Jesus, his death, and the overall purpose of Almighty God in that is found in Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2. 
Beginning in verse number 8, Paul writes, And being found in appearance as a man, he, that is Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. And Paul says, even the death of the cross. Jesus didn't just die. He didn't just die any death. He took on the worst death known. Even the death of the cross. Therefore, Scripture says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, purpose. Purpose in the sacrifice uh, that Jesus made. And aren't you glad Jesus went to the cross? I'm glad he didn't get up there and say, wait a minute, this is enough. I've gone far enough. You're not about to drive nails through my hands and through my feet. I'm not going to wear this crown of thorns. It's over. It's done. No. Jesus went all the way to the cross of Calvary, willingly stretched out his arms and allowed them to do. Please never forget that Jesus had the power at any moment to stop everything. But as the song says, he died alone for you and for me. He could have called those 10,000 angels, said the words, snapped his fingers, whatever it would have taken, it could have been done. But what was his prayer? Father, not my will, but thy will be done. But let's talk about, as we close, the salvation. We talked a little bit about sufficiency and satisfaction and substitution and even the sacrifice. I want to get to the end result. What did all of that bring about? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 again says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. That last part here, salvation. The salvation is seen in those words to bring us to God. To bring us to God. And that's what reconciliation is. Remember, sin separates us from God. And the blood of Jesus Christ that he poured out at the cross is the means of our salvation, our reconciliation back to God. Jesus died in order to reconcile us, in order that you and I could, could be brought back into good standing, back into fellowship uh, with God. That's what the redemption of man really is all about. It's about you and I being able to be reconciled back to God the Father. And all of this centers on one person, and you know who that person is. If you don't remember, maybe you can answer this question. Who's the main character of the Bible? Jesus Christ. He's the main character. And this is what it's all about. It centers on him. I'm fixing to share with you my all-time favorite scripture. I probably say that in every lesson almost. This is one of those verses, if you haven't highlighted it or noted it somehow in your own Bible, it's in 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 17. Great passage. Paul says, beginning in verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, he says, all things have become new. He goes on, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry. Think about this now. Has given us the ministry of reconciliation that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us he says the word of reconciliation now love this part in this next verse now then now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you on the behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That's what every human being needs, is reconciliation. To be brought back into a right relationship with God because of sin. To be reconciled to God. And verse 21, the climax and sum of all of it, says, For he, God, made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin, 
for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him that's the eternal purpose and plan of God's scheme of redemption and it's all possible in and through and because of Jesus Christ God's wrath has been taken away and you and I have the opportunity for salvation for redemption the price has been paid to be reconciled the way has been made as Jesus said as we're gonna examine uh, in in one of the final I am statements in John 14 next week so this is kind of a, a sample what you're gonna get next week probably one of my favorites in the I am's John 14 in verse 6 you know what he said I am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the Father but by me so tonight as we think about these things those two words they start with the letter R redemption and reconciliation praise God for his unspeakable gift the gift of Jesus Christ there at the cross on Calvary for you and for me so my question for all of us tonight is what will you do with that gift I believe everybody here is a Christian a child of God but you and I have been given a ministry we are now as Christians described as one beggar telling other beggars where to find bread and water we've been given the ministry of reconciliation to go out and tell people about Jesus about his sacrifice for them and what they need to do in response to his love and the sacrifice he made maybe tonight as we leave this building we need to be reminded of where we're headed what we're going back into there's a sign on the door right out there in between the doors as you leave you know what it says don't you you're now entering your mission field and in that mission field we have one agenda and that is to evangelize to tell people about Jesus to tell people about his love his sacrifice it's not just for me not just for us it's for the entire world and our world needs to hear that good news and they need to hear it from us they need to see it they need to experience it will you tell that good news maybe tonight we can help you in some way maybe as a Christian you've fallen short you haven't been living that redeemed and reconciled life you've wandered back into sin we're going to sing a song to encourage. If we can help you in any way, please come as we stand together and sing.
guys can see it. Uh, we'll sing whatever's on this one, and then we'll have our closing prayer. <clears throat> there is. 